The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. From the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, this is Legend is Legends. I'm Jason Bryant. Prepare for a journey through wrestling's past, present, and future as we'll hear the great stories of wrestling and success from the true legends of the sport here on Hall of Fame Legends. In the shadowed ruins of Rome's ancient basilica, Doug Blubaugh battled the world champion from Iran for the Olympic gold medal. Imam Ali Habibi had never known defeat. Three times the Persian attacked, each time throwing the young American into danger. Then a swift counterattack from Blue Ball hurled his opponent to his back. Suddenly, the struggle was ended. Thus did an Oklahoma farm boy reach the apex of a brilliant athletic career, earning the 1960 Olympic gold medal at 160 and a half pounds, and with it, the recognition as the outstanding wrestler in the world. Doug Blue Ball was no stranger to the role of champion. He won NCAA honors for Oklahoma State in 1957 and national AAU freestyle titles in 1957 when he was named the OW and in 1959. A year before his Olympic conquest, he won a gold medal at the 1959 Pan American Games in Chicago, matching the 1955 achievement of his brother Jack. They were the first brothers to capture Pan Am titles. Blue Ball is remembered too for his epic struggles with a former college teammate Phil Kenyon. Over four years of freestyle competition, they met 13 times. The first 12 bouts ended in draws, 11 of them scoreless. Five of these were at the 1960 Olympic trials before Blue Ball crashed through for a takedown, a victory that sent him on to Olympic glory. From a competitive career totaling more than 400 victories against just 17 defeats, Blue Ball turned to coaching and won added respect for his teaching skills and his honesty and his dedication. After seven years as an assistant at Michigan State, during which he was the freestyle coach of U.S. teams in the 1971 Pan American Games and World Championships, he spent a decade as the head coach at Indiana University. As a champion athlete of awesome achievement and as a living example to young men of the highest standards and character of integrity, Douglas Moreland Blueball is honored as a distinguished member of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Class of 1979. Russ, it's an honor and great privilege to be here to present Doug Bluebaugh to the Hall of Fame. Uh, as Russ said, I was quite interested in wrestling in the 30s and uh, early 40s, but uh, the war came along and uh, uh, cut my wrestling career short at that time, and I was away from it for many years. And uh, then I had a son who I wanted to get interested in wrestling. And I had my college coach was Claude Scher, who a lot of you older fellows will remember. He coached at uh, Case Institute Technology for uh, about 45 years. And uh, about the time that I wanted to send my son to a wrestling camp, and I'd read some articles about Doug Bluebaugh, although I didn't know Doug. So I said to Claude, who's Doug Bluebaugh? He said, Doug's the greatest. So I decided, well, there, that's the place I'm going to send my son to the camp. So I went up there. It was in June of uh, 1973 uh, at the opening day of his camp. And uh, the camp was on a hill outside of Bloomington. Uh, There was a heavily wooded hill. And he had carved that camp out of this hill, out of that woods, with the help of one other fellow. And they'd done it in about a year's time. They had built a 6,000 square foot wrestling room. They had built a 3,000 square foot recreation hall. They had built five chalets where the wrestlers could stay. And then during the winter, Doug could uh, uh, rent those out to students from the University of Indiana. It was really a great achievement. And I stayed at the camp that night, went to bed, and they had uh, three sessions of wrestling a day in the morning and in the afternoon and the evening. And Doug taught all three of those sessions. He was there the full time, and he taught the whole thing. Well, after the evening session, I went to bed, 
And about midnight, I hear this bulldozer running. Kept me awake practically all night. And uh, finally, it quieted down. And about 6 o'clock in the morning, the bulldozer's out there running again. And I had a friend there, Tom Milkovich, that was helping Doug with the camp. I said, Tom, who was that out there running that bulldozer practically all night? He said, oh, that's Doug. He's three sessions of wrestling during the day, and he's out there running that bulldozer all night. I'll tell you, I've been around for 65 years, and I've never seen a fella that will work as hard as Doug Glubaugh does. And he doesn't run in place. He's got ambition to accomplish something, and he's got the dedication to do it. And that's what he did during his wrestling career. He <clears throat> first had his eye on the state championship for Oklahoma. After he got through that, he had his eye on the national collegiate championship, which he won. And after that, he had his eye on the Olympic championship. And he, he attained every one of those goals because he had the dedication to do it. And this is the type of man that's made the United States the greatest country in the world. And I'm proud to introduce Doug and have him come up here and accept his induction into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Doug had a difficult time deciding who was going to represent him or present him here to the Hall of Fame because his first coach was Claude, was uh, Mel Claude Fetter. Uh, that was his uh, junior high coach, and he coached him in high school. And then Grady Penninger came along, and he was Grady's first state champion back in 1952, I believe. And then he went to, the, uh, to Oklahoma A&M, and he was Myron Roderick's first national champion. And that was in 1957. Myron had just taken over the coaching reins at uh, Oklahoma a and that year, and Doug was his first champion. Then his Olympic coach was Port Robertson, and he was Port Robertson's first Olympic champion, of course, followed by Terry McCann and Shelby Wilson. So it was a very difficult decision to, to make among all those fellows that had helped him with his career. So he decided, well, I'll just uh, select a good friend, and he selected me, and it was my great pleasure to present him. Thank you. You know, I thought for quite a while when I got up here, what would I say? And I thought that when I thought about all the people that were already in this and the people that were going into this tonight with me, I thought if there was ever a time to keep your mouth shut, your eyes and ears open, and practice humility, this was one of them. <laughs> when I went over to the Hall of Fame today and uh, went through it with my boys and was just looking at all the people who were already in there, it made me believe this even more so. I think of all the people that have helped me in my life with wrestling and a lot of other things in my life as far as building character and teaching you the, the really the valuable things in life. All those people are already in there. The people that I revered as, as a young man when I looked up to. And I go there and there they are. And I never dreamed of ever really being in there with them because I put them up so high. I, I start out with the the people that, that coached me. You know, I didn't do anything on my own. I didn't invent anything. I'm, no, I'm nothing but a part of everybody that's been around me. I try to pick out the best parts of everybody that's around as far as the wrestling and as far as the things I like. And that's what I am as far as a wrestler. I'm just parts of everyone that I have touched in wrestling. Martin Roderick's in there. I'm probably one of the few people that's ever wrestled against him, with him, and for him. Believe me... It's much easier to wrestle for him and with him than against him. <laughs> I saw the fireman's carry for the first time, several times, the first time I wrestled against him. I'm glad that I was with him after that. Coach Griffith, uh, one of the finest men I've ever met in my life, 
uh, is in it. I used to go up to the coach's office and just sit and I never talked much around him. I let him talk. Figure when you're around people like that, you don't talk, you listen. And the things he taught me that were of such value were not just holes, they were things of life that were important. And he's in it. Coach Robertson at Oklahoma University. One of the finest men. It's people like this that, that make the wrestling, the federation, things like this strong. There are people that are, that are true and honest. It's, to me, it's like a hole that won't lie to you. There are people that are so solid that they'll never fall. Poor Robertson's one of those people. I can't say enough for the man. Tommy Evans. I thought he, he was my first hero as a young man. The reason why is because my brothers were down at OU and Tommy came and lived with us one summer. And I thought, boy, if I could ever be as good a wrestler as him. And he's in the Hall of Fame. I spent a long time at Michigan State. I had a lot of talks, a lot of time to spend with Mr. Collins, Coach Collins. Probably one of the most gentle people you'll ever meet in your life. He's in the Hall of Fame. Terry McCann, one of my best friends. I don't, I couldn't say enough for the man. As far as being tough, there isn't any way you could ever be any tougher than Terry McCann. As far as having integrity, being honest, he's it. He's just the epitome. They're all alike, really. It's all just a one, it's a, it's a mold. Everybody's the same as far as the way they really are down deep inside. Terry McCann's one of those people, and I, I've, I hear some of the other people speak of Terry McCann. Uh, Russ Ellickson spoke of Terry McCann. I could say the same things about him, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Gray Simons, we've been on teams together. We've shared things over and over, and he's in the Hall of Fame. I go right on down the line. I keep going, and, I, and it makes me feel I never dreamed I would ever be a part of this group. I even have another connection. Uh, I just told him this evening. Joe McDaniel. Some people don't know the connection Joe and I have, but when he was here in 37, I believe, I think his first national title was in the 38, when I was down here in 1953, as a freshman, you weren't eligible. In 1954, as a sophomore, I was on the team. When I was issued my clothes to wrestle in, the tights that I was given had Joe McDaniel's name on the label. <laughs> so we have a very close relationship. They'd been, <laughs> they had been split out so many times in a crotch and sewed up so much that you couldn't have put your legs together if you'd have wanted to. <laughs> 100% wool. <laughs> I thought it was funny that here it is in 1954, and I had Joe McDaniel's tights in 1957, 1950, I mean, that he wore in 1937. So I have a relationship with a lot of people that are already inducted into the Hall of Fame. And as I say, if there's ever a time, if there was ever a time in my life that I feel humble, it would be now. I thank you very, very much. Legends is presented by the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and produced by the Matt Talk Podcast Network. If you want to hear more from wrestling's legends, contribute to this ongoing project at halloffamelegends.org slash contribute. One time and small monthly donation options are available. We hope you've enjoyed this look into wrestling history. This has been Legends. I'm Jason Bryant.